Hey listeners, welcome back. Today is the next episode of Dot Dot Dot, the Nine Dot Arts podcast. And on our episode today, we have Andy Rockmore, principal at Shears Adkins Rockmore. I'm excited to share Andy's perspective with you. I thought it was pretty interesting that as an architect, he's looking at the negative space as being the most important. So the spaces in between buildings, cafes, music, parks, art, all that creativity and culture, bringing ideas together and creating those moments where people want to go and enjoy and spend time. So take a listen to Andy today. Make sure that you check him out, not only on LinkedIn, but on their company's website. That is S-A-R-Arch.com, S-A-R-A-R-C-H.com and hear his perspective. And for those of you who haven't already, make sure to check out our state of the art report. Um, Nine Dot Arts brings to life the information and data behind the importance of art in the built environment. So let's get to the show. All right. Thanks everyone for being here today. I have Andy Rockmore, principal with SAR joining us. Andy, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the opportunity. Happy to be here. Well, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about you, what you do, how you got into the field, and um, some things you're excited about? Uh, I've been in Denver for 27 years. Got here in 1994. I originally grew up in upstate New York and went to school back there. And then came in the early 90s, perfect time to be in Denver and such a great place to be an architect with all the development that's been happening. And in that time, I have been so lucky to work on just a number of of projects, big and small. Uh, I really cut my teeth in my career working on the uh, three pedestrian bridges that uh, along the 16th Street Mall. I uh, just happened to be in the room at the right time when someone needed uh, a bridge over the Platte River. And that turned into the Millennium Bridge and the Platte River Bridge and the one over I-25. And um, it helped me really see the power and impact of urban infrastructure and and what is now a a really strong connection from Highlands to downtown Denver. But um, along the way, uh, helped with two other principles uh, create Shears Atkins Rockmore. And we're now a 50 person firm uh, in, in Lodo. And we do just mostly urban work. Uh, A lot of multifamily, which Denver has seen pretty considerably over the last, certainly since the, in this previous cycle, since about 2010. Uh, But most of our work is, like I said, it's in and around the urban core. We're also doing work um, in small markets around the country, um, in Ogden and Tempe, Kansas City, um, San Diego looking at a um, designing a tower right now in Miami, which is pretty fun. So we're spreading out, um, but also doing a lot of work here in Denver, all with a, a, a real focus on interaction and connection. I, we use the term urban, not to really ex- say city, so to speak, but really what makes cities wonderful. And that is all of the integration and diversity that cities provide. So even in a small school campus, for instance. It's that urban ideal of transparency and connection between students and teachers and participation that we bring a lot to our work. Well, there's a lot of the theme of connection and what you just described, uh, you know, of connecting neighborhoods through a bridge, connecting people and places. For some of our uh, audience that might be dialing in from different parts of the country or even different parts of the world, Um, Could you tell us a little bit more about your work as an architect, Andy, and and the perspective of creating an urban plan and and the significance of those bridges as connection points? As someone who works a lot in cities, it's uh, the, the, the true work is in the spaces between the buildings. So we are, we uh, often talk about not designing objects, uh, which are buildings or bridges, but designing uh, public spaces, the spaces between the objects. Because we're urbanists and, and mostly you're infilling, right? You're, you're dealing with a, uh, you're trying to contribute to an existing context. We do not do any single family houses on an amazing, you know, 20,000 acre ranch where, where it is really an object in the landscape. It does tend to focus more 
outward. We do uh, most of our work is very extroverted and fairly transparent in in the true sense of that word uh, in in creating blurring the line between inside and out, uh, contributing to a, a street environment uh, or connecting neighborhoods, like you said. I love that. The spaces between the buildings. I don't think you hear many architects talking about things that are not buildings. So that's pretty, <laughs> pretty intriguing. They're, they're more important than the buildings. What role does, does art and culture play in those in-between spaces or even as in the way that you think about design? I think it plays a huge role and art primarily is used as foreground, uh, wonderfully so. So just as the buildings really cr help define public spaces, I think art helps our work uh, be the foreground in those spaces. So if, if art is the foreground, could you tell us more an example of a project you've worked on that you feel was really successful in that way of incorporating art and architecture? The Dairy Block in downtown uh, in Lodo is a, is a great example because the foreground elements aren't anything that I think, um, it's not, a, it's, it's not all that obvious. It's not like a museum, which tries to create a neutral background to really highlight the art. It's, uh, you know, the greatest works of art are people, right? Um, they are the foreground element. So, um, yeah, and Dairy Block, I think, does that really well. It blurs that line by taking even utilities become art, right? Things that you wouldn't necessarily assume are, uh, are sort of generative in the way that people are generative, that they are the life. Um, the utilities, the, the uh, surfaces, the objects in and throughout Dairy Block, I think, really create an incredibly rich experience. I love that. The greatest works of art are people. I've always felt like having kids, they, they were like my sculptures. Like I got to make them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then they make themselves, don't they? And then they make themselves, they do. Like great works of art. Exactly. So Andy, tell us in your mind, uh, what makes a great city? What are the components? The life of a city is, of course, in its streets. And now what I'm so excited about in Denver is, is the transition away from just streets as infrastructure for cars, right? We're now designing three bridges at Broadway Station, uh, which visually connect to each other, which um, highlight peds and bicyclists above vehicles, which is really exciting. You know, it's funny for an architect to say this, but I don't think it's the buildings that make a great city. It's the buildings that create the public spaces that make a great city. It's silly to say, but I think this is Denver, uh, this is Denver's century. Other cities, Chicago, New York, they had the last century, but I really feel like Denver's positioned to be uh, a major, major place in this next century. How do you think about community engagement when you're approaching this kind of design? The distinction between public and private continues to blur. Technology helps that. The pandemic has helped that. Um, buildings now are much more flexible. And it's not also what, what I think is wonderful to see in Denver especially is that it's also transitioning vertically. Most cities have an incredible public ground plane and then everyone above is private. But because of the urban residential work that's been going on, I think that transition is happening now. How does art or placemaking contribute to density? I mean, how do you factor that or measure it, I guess? The first thing that comes to mind is, is if you have a real successful foreground that it can support much larger background. You can have great mm. density um, if without that foreground element, which is you know, five to 10% maybe, then it's just oppressive density. But if you can find ways, you know, art also and people have a way of creating space and energy around themselves, um, which is really important and positive. So not only do they draw people towards them, um, but they also create these wonderful bubbles um, and I think that art, when used successfully, um, does that. It creates its own environments. 
You talked about so many different people and in a city, of course, it's this, you know, amalgamation of people, different ages, different backgrounds, you know, different stories. How do you design places that are appealing, you know, universally? The transparency, I think, is is absolutely critical and access and um, the benefit of volition that people, uh, I think, need multiple choices always. Uh, so corralling people into one place or another is has generally been found to be unsuccessful. I think Denver and our work continues to really question some of the the age-old principles of, um, this is a bit specific, but putting the most density of a site on, on a corner or on an intersection. These intersections have great potential to actually be urban rooms, better urban rooms than the streets themselves. So we're continuing to see the power and possibility of actually the opposite effect. So our work is now exploring that careful tension of creating density, creating that that negative space, which is the life of a city, um, by not packing it full of building, but by letting a city breathe in the right moments. I love that idea of urban rooms and negative space that aren't, you know, taken by buildings, but that maybe have little moments of of discovery and socialization, right? Because we're all coming out of this time of being isolated and wanting to find ways to be together again. Yeah, and this is what's happening. I think now Denver is growing enough. We're, we're, uh, Meow Wolf is a great example. So we put Meow Wolf. Meow Wolf came from Santa Fe, had a number of choices of sites. They could have just done some infill sites, but they saw, this is not us, they saw the opportunity by building a building nestled within uh, on-ramps, off-ramps, I-25. It sits partially under a viaduct, uh, the Colfax Viaduct. It's fascinating, right? And they said, boy, won't this be interesting? The reason it's interesting is because it interacts with the city. We still have a lot of land. A lot of the surface parking lots, a lot of uh, land that has yet to be filled in. But I think now people are understanding exactly what you and I are talking about, about how a, a building contributes to a context and contributes to the experiences. Of those open sites, are there any of those that you'd really love to get your hands on? <laughs> All of them. Uh, well, the River Mile has been amazing um, playing with that. That's 15 million square feet of potential development along what has been seen as just this residual space in the Platte Valley. It sits between the natural environment of the river and the built environment of, of the central business district. And what that means architecturally is just fascinating. It's how, how do you pull all of that together? So again, the, the buildings aren't objects, aren't precious objects, they're, um, they're connectors. They're trying to synthesize those two worlds. Uh, so, and I think a lot of the good architecture does that. It's, it's performative. It's not aesthetic. It's not wh whether in, I think, maybe 50 years ago, it was a beautiful building was regarded as just beautiful aesthetically. And now architecture is far more performance-based. What is it doing? And uh, not just not just for the people who occupy it, but for the people around it. Not don't just ask what the building can do for you, but what can, <laughs> yes. what can the building do for our country? Do for us, yes. So, anything else that you would like to share today that we haven't covered in our conversation? Just that um, I know we touched a little bit on art, but um, I think it gets back to what I just maybe was was trying to articulate that art is not aesthetic. Uh, it's it's performative and um, it's integral. And I think there's a real danger, just like we went through for a long time and probably are still going through with sustainability as an applied layer. And we've we've mm. evolved finally enough to see that it's integral. I think art uh, art is the same way. Um, it's, it's an absolutely vital piece. 
and without it, um, you're really left with a lot of background, right? And, uh, there's a missing piece. Well, what's the value of having an art consultant on your team when you're when you're designing? There's an architect, there's an engineer, there's an art consultant, there's an acoustician. Uh, we all have our different languages and, and we all are responsible for contributing and making something. The architect is not the maker. Uh, the team is. I mean, our best, our best work by far um, has that successful integration. You know, we, we need that language at the table. After a year in this changing world with COVID, what are you bringing with you into the future and what are you going to leave behind? I'm going to leave this background behind. I'm going to leave this home <laughs> office behind. <laughs> I can't wait. You're eager to get back. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, very. It has been uh, wonderfully focused. Uh, I think we're all, uh, without rushing to meetings and, and getting in your car on, on the 16th Street Mall to get to and from meetings, there, I've enjoyed a lot more efficiency. Um, I'm working on 16 projects right now, and I don't think that would be possible uh, if I were in the office. And and I think just the the um, there's just a certain rigor I think that we've all learned to work with, which has been really successful. Sure, it's it's um, I hope that within that it allows the gaps to fill in rather than the way it used to be, where you walk into a meeting and 20 minutes of that meeting are spent chit-chatting, saying goodbye, doing all these things. You really get about a good half hour of an hour meeting of substance. Uh, what I have found now is that you get a full hour of substance, and then there are other times in the day that are sort of found, um, these, these great found places where you can also have a very focused uh, connection with someone. Yeah, I think it, the focus that everyone has you know, found in this time is um, will definitely be a challenge to hang on to when we all start uh, becoming more social again. I hope it'll just layer. I hope this is a new foundation of connection and then all of these other connections will come back. Well, Andy, thank you so much for being with us today, sharing more about art and culture as the foreground of any great environment, the spaces between buildings, and um, and your your thoughts on building great cities. Appreciate having you. And could you tell our listeners where they can learn more about you and where they could find you? The best place to find me is on our website, s-a-r-a-r-c-h dot com, uh, or on our um, our company Instagram or any of the socials. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Andy. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, Martha. It's great.